What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. God bless you for being here. If this is your first time here, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and notification bell because chances are you're a first time filmmaker trying to figure this out on a budget and that is exactly what this channel is about. Now typically I do videos on uh, editing inside of LumaFusion and I know those are my most popular ones but I have to take a break right now because LumaFusion is about to do their biggest update ever and it would require me to redo most of the content that I'm planning to do next. So I kind of want to give a pause for a second and just let that hit the market so you don't have to watch the same video over and over and over again. So today we're going to do something a little bit different and that's we're going to talk about the steps you need to take if you're wanting to create your first documentary film. Now these steps will work if you're wanting to do a, a regular scripted feature length film, but I'm gonna gear them primarily towards documentaries because that's what I was asked for. Now there are a lot of steps to take, so this is gonna be a long video. It may even end up being two videos, so just bear with me on that because we're gonna go through step by step, one by one, and make sure we hit everything you might need to know so that you can get started. And I want to just preface it by letting you know, if this is what you're wanting to do and you think like I did when I first started, you need to just grab a microphone, grab your iPhone, hit the streets running and have your documentary in a film festival by this time next year. You really don't understand how much is involved and this is definitely the video for you. So let's go ahead and jump in and start working on making our first documentary. So basically filming a movie boils down to five steps. You have your planning phase, which is where you're at now. You have your pre-production, you have your production, you have your post-production, and you have your distribution phase. And each of those has its own place to play. Each of them plays into each other and each has its own different length of time that you're gonna spend on it. So your planning stage and your post-production stage, those are gonna be your two biggest ones. That's where you're gonna be spending the bulk of your time. That's gonna be where you're coming up with what you want your film to be and where you're making your film what it is. Everything in between is just playing off of those two. So what is the planning stage? Well, in the planning stage is really, really where you should be getting a really good idea of what you want your film to be but don't let yourself fall into the trap a lot of people fall into of thinking that well this is a documentary so the interviews i do with people are going to be making the the story not me even with a documentary you should have a really good idea of what you want your story to be long before you ever pick up a camera and you should be prepared just like any other filmmaker for that story to change completely so what all is involved in planning out a documentary? Well, the first step should probably be understanding what your documentary is gonna be about. And that's a little bit more than just saying, for example, oh, I wanna do something about the workers at Amazon, because that doesn't really give you the story, does it? So staying with the Amazon workers, let's answer some questions. What are some questions you have about it? I know me personally, like a couple of questions I would have is what was it like for them during the pandemic? Was their job harder? There was so many people that came on. What was it like starting in a company so white? Are the rumors true about not being allowed to take bathroom breaks? Like all of these are little questions that are out there that could be answered. And if you're focused on answering one or two of these questions, you have your documentary story. So now you have to go into the research phase. So how do you do research for a documentary? Like, What do you need to do? Well, obviously you need to research the topic. You need to look into Amazon hiring practices. You need to look into what it's, who do you know that works there? Who can you get a hold of? What is it gonna take to get permission to do it? Legally, what can you do? Things like this need to go into play because you need to have those questions answered before you go to sell it. The other thing you need to do as far as research is you need to see who else has made this film? So if you were to go research this topic, what are you gonna find? Are there gonna be people who have made a documentary about the employees of Amazon? If so, what did it look like? Is it the same movie you're making? Can you make this movie without infringing upon their copyrights? Things like that need to be answered before you move to the next stage, which is understanding who your audience is. That means you need to know what platform you're gonna release this on. There are really, 
multiple ways to release it. You can stream it through big networks like Amazon, ironically, Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, things like that. You can self-release it on Vimeo or YouTube. You can send it to a film festival. So that's why you need to know who your audience is so you can be gearing the, the rest of this planning phase towards how you are going to distribute this. When you know what audience you're aiming towards, you're then going to be able to figure out what style of documentary you want to make. Now there are six basic styles, but we're going to stick with the four primary ones, which are expository, participatory, observational, and performative. Expository is going to be more of your expose style. This is more of your dateline or headline news where a story is being told through uh, a subject speaking directly to the camera or news footage or things like that with a narrator kind of guiding you from scene to scene. It's very much no interaction between the filmmaker and the subject and it's really relying on the narrator to control the, the uh, narrative. Where with expository there's almost no interaction between the filmmaker and the subject. With the participatory it's divine, defined by the interactions between the filmmaker and the subject. Think of like a Michael Moore type film or Dirty Jobs or something where the filmmaker is actually talking to the subject and on camera interviewing them. That's your participatory style. Observational will be the one you primarily see the most. So this is your Tiger King style where it's literally you're just observing and letting the story tell itself. There are going to be interviews, there are going to be FaceTime one-on-one, -on -one, but for the most part, the filmmaker is not a part of a story, they're not in the story, they're just watching the story with you and helping to tell the story. And then you have the last one, which is the performative. Super Size Me is a great performative. This one is kind of where the filmmaker is the subject, is, is, is not just interacting with the subject, it's controlling the subject. It is, you are the focus of the story. So though, one of those four is primarily what you're going to want to do because those are the ones that have shown to be marketable. So it's starting to look like we have a pretty good idea of a documentary, right? We know our subject, we know our audience, and we have a pretty good idea of what style we're going to use. So now we need to start thinking about how are we going to fund this? And the reason that becomes a, an issue now is because the way you fund it is going to determine a lot of different aspects of it. For example, let's say you're going to sell this to Netflix. Their business model is around people binge watching, so they're most likely going to want a docu-series, meaning seven to ten episodes, and you're going to need to be able to know you can film enough footage to create seven to ten hours. Whereas if you're going to just simply take it to a film festival and hope someone picks it up from there, then you only need to have enough footage for an hour and a half. You see how understanding how you're going to sell it or how you're going to fund it really is starting to play into the next steps that you're going to take. So let's talk about the different types of funding that you can use. There are a few different ways to fund a film and I'm going to talk about them, but I'm going to talk about them in the order of ideal to please don't ever do this. So ideal is going to be to go through investors. And, and by investors, this could be crowdfunding, this could be reaching out to people you know and everybody gives you a small amount of money for a bit of the royalties of the film once you sell it, or you find someone who's just going to, by themselves, donate your full budget and just take money back if and when you sell it. The reason this is your best way is because it allows you to make the film you want, you have complete creative control, and you have, are taking on zero risk financially. All of your risk is basically reputational because chances are if you've got somebody to invest in your film sight unseen, they're doing it because they expect that you're going to be able to sell it and they're going to get a huge chunk of the money. You're actually not going to get as big of a payday out of this version, but you're going to get your film made with very little risk to you. Second way, which is almost as good, is to go ahead and sell it to a network or a distributor or a film studio such as a Netflix 
prior to filming. Now, the reason you want to sell it prior to filming is because you want the money in the bank before you start so that you know what you're getting into. Now, the drawbacks to this are they get to dictate the length of your film. They get to, you're probably going to need to have someone with some type of reputation already attached as a director or a, a DP or something like that so that they can say, okay, this is a marketable person. We're going to be able to trust that they're going to make a film. So it's, it's harder for a first time filmmaker to do either of those first two tiers unless you know the, the someone somewhere along the way or if you have a person with a reputation attached to them who is willing to step in and help. So yes, you're gonna get your budget, but you have limitations on selling directly to a distributor and that you are gonna to have to adhere to their guidelines, which may also mean that if you go over budget, they don't give you any more money and they don't allow you to get money from someone else. So you're going to have to start eating cost yourself. So you've got to keep those things in mind as well. The next way, which is the last of the safe ways, is to apply for grants and to reach out. There are all kinds of public traded companies, private companies, charitable organizations, things like that, that are that have grants set up to help first time filmmakers. This is the way I would actually suggest most of you go and then you gear your budget around the money you get as opposed to you want to make this specific movie so you're going to go with the more expensive and uh, the more expensive way of making it this way is harder and more time consuming but again it is zero risk to you you are more likely to get a grant as a first time filmmaker than you are to get Netflix to buy your documentary. And I'm not saying you won't get Netflix to buy it. I'm saying if you want them to buy it sight unseen, you're going to need to have some pretty good solid story going and you're going to need to sell it. You're going to need to be a great salesperson or you're going to need to have somebody with a reputation. Whereas with going for the grant, you literally just have to meet their criteria and sell them the idea because they're not investing millions of dollars, they're investing tens of thousands. That makes sense. And the last way is self-funding. Please don't self-fund your movie. If you are going to self-fund your movie, please do it over a very extended period of time. By that, I mean save up some money, buy a camera. Save up some money, buy some lighting equipment. Save up some money, do this. Save up some money, do that. Self-funding is still not going to be cheap. Even the cheapest self, cheapest budget you can come up with, self-funding is still going to be thousands of dollars. So if you lose that gamble, that's going to be very, very bad. We covered the five stages you're gonna go through, the planning, the pre-production, production, post-production, post -production, and distribution. We're still in the planning stage, but we did cover a lot. We covered the sub, how to figuring out what our subject is, figuring out our audience, um, the style we're going to shoot in, how we're going to distribute it, and how we're going to fund it. And that leads us into a deep dive into our budget. But that still doesn't even take us out of the planning stage. So that really, again, goes to show you exactly how much time and energy you're going to need to be willing to invest in this film to get it made. Okay, so why is it important to do the budget before you even sell it? You can't go to a distributor and say, I want $100,000 to make this film because they're gonna ask you where the money's gonna go. And if you don't have your budget laid out, then they're not gonna give you the money. No, I don't care who you are. If you were Steven Spielberg, they wouldn't give him the money even though he has the reputation he has. So really narrowing down how you're gonna spend your money is really important at this stage. So when you go to your investors, you can tell them exactly how it is you're planning to spend their money. So I use that as a jumping off point to create this template here that we're gonna use for our video. So as you see here, this is basically just a standard uh, Google Sheet. It's, it's a spreadsheet like anything else. I'm gonna talk about all the different compartments we have here. I just wanna go over it real quick. 
on our tabs we have each tab is a different set for the budget you have your main page here which is this is going to be your starting off point this is going to be where you're really the, probably the page you're going to spend the most time on because this is how you're going to know what you're asking for and how much you're asking for and why this is kind of this is what you're going to share to investors right this is what they're going to want to see they're going to want to know about the movie they're going to want to know about what how much money you're asking for so you'll see here that i have three separate budgets what are those budgets well you start with your bare bones your bare bones is the minimum amount you're going to be able to get away with making this film on like if you don't make this much money you're not going to make the movie is basically what this is then you have your ideal budget which is if i want to make the movie that i want to make this is how much money i'm going to need and then you have your perfect budget which is exactly how it sounds this is jeff bezos gave me his checkbook said i don't care what it costs make this movie so this is if i can make my dream come true this is what it would be so we're going to come down here and we're going to open up our perfect tab now the reason we're going to start with our perfect tab is because that's going to help us really nail down all of the things we're going to need to have this is this is how you know what you're spending the money on is by figuring out what your dream budget would be first and then you can scale those back so that you're still getting the important items just at a better price so i have everything in here broken down into categories and i have them in order of importance i have our camera gear because you have to have a camera you can't film a documentary without it our lighting and sound because without lights without sound you have silent pictures which went out in the 1930s i have our production cost which is could be actually you could put this as pre-production because this is just all of the stuff offset i have our crew cost and i have our post-production and our promotion and distribution now you notice i don't have anything in here for promotion and distribution and that's because this isn't the time to think about that we don't really budget that this early you want it on the template so that when it comes time to budget it in you can throw it in there and keep it with the regular budget but i don't do this at this point for several reasons not the least of which being if i'm gonna sell this to a movie studio they're gonna pay for the promotion of the film they're gonna pay to distribute it i don't have to worry about that if i'm just making this for a uh if i'm making this for pbs pbs might pitch in some they might not i might have to do that later it's, it's if i'm doing it for film festivals then all i'm really needing to do is create one dvd and send it to the festival so it just really depends on what's happening and you're not at that point in the planning stage to really talk about promotion and distribution yet so how do we figure out what it is we need so with cameras chances are you're not at a level to be able to use something like a uh like an Ari Alexa, which is top of the line, basically. Like that's the best of the best. And it's worth a hundred and something thousand dollars of its price because it's going to give you the best picture you can imagine. But you, it also comes with a very, very steep learning curve. And it's probably not something you're gonna be able to pick up and start with. So we're gonna start with a mirrorless camera or a DSLR. And the best of those is the Sony A7 three and it again comes with a price tag that shows you that it is the best this thirty five hundred dollars is the camera body only with no lenses so you're going to need to purchase lenses with it so how do we know what lenses we need well what i came up with here is to have one wide angle lens and one portrait lens or if you're wanting to do interview style so that you have a really nice tight shot on your subject and you don't have to have the camera just a couple of feet away to do it. And like I said, you're going to need to have your camera on a tripod at some time. You're gonna want it to be a heavy duty tripod. You don't want it to be collapsing on you. And so you want something you're gonna be able to carry. And I found one, I believe it was a Manfredo for about $140 that would really cover all of that perfectly. And then like I said, you're gonna need a camera bag to carry everything in you're going to need probably about six compartments because you're going to need to put your batteries in you're you don't know what you're going to need in there so i usually try to keep a six compartment one for the camera one for each lens your filters need to go somewhere so you want to have about six compartments in there 
and you can get those for just under a hundred dollars you're gonna need at least three batteries i the price i found for the batteries was about thirty dollars each so i figure about a hundred dollars as far as sd cards go they're gonna run you a really good sd card is gonna run you roughly around uh 30 to 50 dollars each and you're gonna want about four or five if you're, you're gonna want at least a terabyte per day of shooting so i figured at about 200 dollars. and then of course your miscellaneous should be probably about 10 percent of your budget all right and your second most important category is obviously your lighting and sound um most of these are pretty much self-explanatory i just went the highest level I could. Now you'll see I had the fill light, backlight, and key light put in here separately. They're the same light, but they, they do different things. I have them separately because I kind of envision this as being a possibility of doing the run and gun style where I'm inside the actual Amazon plant talking to someone one-on-one. -on -one. So all I'm gonna need is my key light. I don't need my fill light or backlight. You can really buy the entire kit, but this, for that purpose, I put it separately. Um, you wanna have two different, recording two different styles. The reason you wanna have two is if something goes wrong with the lavalier, you have the boom mic as a backup, but it's not going to be as good a quality as the lavalier. So you wanna have both. And I have two audio recorders. I just went with an HN4. That's a pretty good quality uh, recorder, but it's about $250. And then of course you need batteries and again, SD cards to record all this on and our miscellaneous. Okay, so now we go into our production costs. And this is just your basic overall, what it's gonna cost you. So I, I picked this permit and license. So. In the city I live, if you're gonna film on a city street and you're going to block any part of the sidewalk, it's gonna cost you $600 a day <clears throat> for a police officer to be there and basically tell people to walk around. So I figured three days worth of that, if we had to interview on the street, I just put it in there. It's not something I necessarily think anyone's gonna need to do, but just in case I have it in the budget, just like the sound stage, if we wanna do one-on-one -on -one interviews inside of the Amazon plant, if they don't offer us a space or it's not quiet enough, then we set it, then we rent a sound stage so that we can control the environment for the conversation. And the truck rental is, it's a lot of equipment. We're gonna to have to need to move it on and off site. So we're gonna to need to rent a truck for that time. And if we're gonna be shooting five days a week, then we're gonna to need to rent for the entire week for the entire duration of the filming, which I assume to be about six weeks, that's your average shooting time for, for a movie. And then you figure you're, you're gonna need a place to do your editing. You need a place to do all of your phone calls and emails and everything. You need an office space. So in here I have an office space rental for six months along with telephones um, and staples, paper. Now this legal fees part, this is really, really important. There's a couple of reasons why. For the least of which being that if you're going to be using someone's image, you need to have them sign a release giving you permission to use it in any way you want, or you're, you're leaving yourself liable to all kinds of suits later. But also, you know, with your crew, with your craft services, with any rentals you do or anything like that, you want to make sure that everything is legal and binding and that you have an attorney on retainer who can help to enforce those contracts for you. And then, you know, if you're going to be in an office, you're probably going to want to have a landline for it. This rigging line here, this is really a secondary miscellaneous. It's miscellaneous on the production, end. meaning if something happens on site and you have to like go buy poles or wiring or gaffing tape or anything to to rig a light or a microphone or, or something because it just you have to go around equipment or some other fiasco happens and you have to re-rig you want to make sure that money is there and then i you see here i have craft services if you're gonna have a full crew with you like they're gonna put their life on hold to film your movie with you take care of them buy them food this is assuming at 
$200 a day. So this would be a pretty, pretty hefty spread when you come down to the low number of crew that you're gonna have for a run and gun style documentary. Okay, so let's talk about crew. Now I said you're only gonna need about four or five, but I actually have six people here on crew, seven if you count the talent. I put talent because I'm, I, I'm just assuming this as an expository type of documentary. If you're not gonna do that, if you're not gonna do a voiceover, then you don't need any kind of talent. But if you are gonna do a voiceover and you do have Jeff Bezos paying you whatever you want, then you might as well get the man himself, Dennis Haysbert, the voice, to be your voiceover guy. Other than that, what you have here is you have your director, which is most likely going to be you, but you do want to get money. So this is going to be how you get your get your money or aside from selling it. So if you're selling, let's say you're selling this to Netflix as a one-off series or one-off movie, they're, they paid you, they're going to pay you what the budget says. So if you put into the budget yourself as the director, then you're gonna be able to know you're at least gonna get make $16,000 for this. And then you're gonna to wanna to have a good DP. The reason you wanna have a good DP is as the director, you're watching what's going on, you're not watching the camera. I can't tell you how many times I've sat here shooting one of these videos and I go to edit and realize I never turned the camera on or I somehow got knocked out of focus. Very well known about my lighting issues in some cases. So. You know, there are things you're not looking for. Like right now I'm looking at the camera. I have a monitor up, but I'm not looking at it constantly. That's what I'm talking about. As the director, you're not going to be constantly looking at your monitor. You wanna have somebody on site who is. The same with sound. You wanna have someone on site who is listening to your audio to make sure you're getting the cleanest, clearest audio possible. You definitely wanna have a sound engineer if you can. And a gaffer is the person who rigs everything for you. You don't necessarily need it, but we have our perfect budget, right? And then your assistant director is kind of putting people in place and your ADP is your focus puller. So while your direct cinematographer is literally eyes on the monitor, they can say focus, do this, do that. And somebody's doing it and they're just watching it and making sure they, they're getting the shot you told them you wanted. So that brings us to post-production which is just as important as your camera and lighting, so it should be equal in your budget. I put it near the bottom, not because it's least important, just because it's the last step. So here I have what, in my humble opinion, is the best setup, which is to have the most current Mac computer and a copy of Final Cut. They are designed to work together and they do so seamlessly and they are worth every penny. Now this is Final Cut Suite. This is not just Final Cut editing software. This is Final Cut with Apple Motion and Apple Compressor. So you're able to fully utilize everything in there. And it's about $400. You want some really good SSD drives so that you can download all of those. You don't want to carry around those SD cards any longer than you have to. And you want to be able to reuse those. So when you get back to the office, you download all of your information onto a really good, really rugged SSD drive. <clears throat> I'm figuring again, this is minimum of two terabytes. You can go higher, you're gonna, and you might need more than four, but this is a good rough starting estimate. Internet, this probably, you could have done this up here with the production cost, but I have it down here because you might not need the internet service as much until you get to this point. You, uh, again, with the monitor, you, a second monitor is just helpful to faster and more precise editing. If you have a professional colorist, they're going to definitely, definitely want two monitors, one on one side to do all their tweaks, the other to have a full screen so they can see everything. So it is in your best interest if you can edit on two monitors to so always do so. Um, visual effects and titles, you're gonna to wanna to invest the money in those if you don't know how to, to make these yourself. And in some cases, even if you do, just for the sake of time, you wanna invest. Now here I have music licenses. And this is, honestly, this is your best bet to go. It's what I use, which is Epidemic Sound. 
their professional level or their commercial level, which is what you would need for this, meaning you can sell it and make as much as you want. You never have to give them any money. It's $300 for one year and they have thousands of songs to choose from. So unless you have a friend who is a musical artist and is willing to do the songs for you for free, you're going to want to pay for it. And this is honestly your best bet. Okay, so there's our perfect budget. And as it being our perfect budget, and this is, you know, the we're not gonna get any better, it's priced that way. It's $170,000 to make our perfect film. We're not going to be making our perfect film, but we this really gave us an idea of everything we wanted to put down for our perfect film. So now we go to our bare bones budget. On our bare bones budget, this is, I can't, this is, this is your, I'm going to finance this myself. I don't want to go into debt budget. So this one is, you know, you're going to film this on the, on your existing cell phone using the native cameras. Um, you can get a decent fluid head tripod from Target for about 50 bucks. You, same with a camera bag, which you may not actually need because you're filming it on your phone. So actually, we're gonna bring that to zero. Um, this, instead of batteries, you're going to want to get some portable chargers that you can carry around with you. <clears throat> and then I put on here a Narbox. I think it's $120. Um, honestly, it's the same thing. You want some kind of, um, something that'll plug into your phone and you're able to offload your footage as fast as possible. <clears throat> you can also do this via iCloud. So all you have to do is go to like Starbucks and transfer it over and then you can also access it via Wi-Fi when you get home. So it is a good thing to have, but you, this is literally just my suggestion. You, there are a million ways you can do this, but you really don't want to spend more than $200 on that part of it. Um, again, we go to our lighting. I'm using a pretty good ring light that I spent 30 bucks on. As you can see, it lights my face pretty well. If I turn off those two lights, I'm still really well lit up off of this ring light. So this ring, and then I turn the lights on in the room, I'm still pretty well lit. As, as you can see, the backlight I feel like do help. But if you're filming in a place that's pretty well lit and you just want to focus your light on, a ring light's going to be just, this ring light will be just fine. So it's a pretty good size. It's already filtered out or already diffused a little bit. So you don't have to worry too much. You just have to have a power supply for it. And that's where this portable phone charger comes in. That's actually the power supply for your ring light. Um, there is a light kit, the, the light kit I use, if you're doing studio, it was 70 bucks. Again, with this one, I would definitely spend the money, get a boom mic. You can get one off Amazon for about 150. Boom pole mic, both included. Um, the pop mic, the lavalier mic I use from time to time is a good one. You can get two of those for $20. And then you use a, a tablet, a second phone, your friend's phone, whatever, as your audio recorder. And you're fine. Or you can even use your phone. You can plug the microphones into your phone if you trust your sound well enough. But if you do that, please get some something that gives you the ability to monitor your audio because I can't tell you how many times I've been on Filmic and I recorded something and I go back to edit and find out that the audio was just insanely loud and I didn't know it. In one case, the microphone stopped working halfway through and I didn't know. So just keep that in mind. Um, your production cost is on your bare bones is assuming that you're just going to do all the editing in your house. You still have your basic legal fees. You don't have as big of a crew and you don't have as much, uh, they don't have as much of a stake. So you're not going to need necessarily the, the same legal fees, but you are going to want to have some, something there and just coffee and donuts, things like that for your, uh, your crew when you do shoot and the same rigging, just about 150, just something just in case. You wanna have some money there. You're, th this is basically, you're just gonna be replacing your boom pole or you need to buy a new light bulb, something like that. And then your crew, 
you can get a DP and a sound engineer. You can get a friend. You can get a film student. They'll do it for a small amount of money, plus credit or royalties off the movie. And then everybody does their own gaffing and you're doing your own editing and you're not doing it. And this one, you if you do it expository, then you're gonna have to figure out, maybe you, you hire someone, maybe you get a film, a, a theater major who's willing to do it for credit as, as having been in a movie, whatever like that, you just have to find other ways to do it without paying anything. And then post-production, yes, that's right, my friends. You see my favorite production software right there in the middle, LumaFusion. You can do everything you see in any documentary you've seen inside of LumaFusion with no problems whatsoever. It's gonna take you a little longer than it would in Final Cut, but it's gonna be the same quality. This is assuming you already own an iPad and, or a computer that, or an iPhone or something that you're already editing in LumaFusion. So I'm taking some liberties on this and assuming that as my audience, you already have LumaFusion and therefore you can actually say this would be zero. And then you're gonna still spend the same money on your uh, music licenses and especially in LumaFusion, you're gonna have to buy your VFX. You're gonna have to buy your titles if you want some really good ones. So you can keep that money into the budget there and you're gonna do your own coloring. So this hour, I need, this is the minimum amount I can get to make it. There it is. There, I can't think of anything on this list that if you, do, unless you already have it, that you can take off this list. So you're still gonna spend about $4,000. So we have our ideal budget or our perfect budget. We have our bare bones budget. Let's take a look at our ideal budget. So what are some things we can change here that will get us below what our perfect budget is, but we're not coming just quite as, as low cost or just quite as, as scraping as we are with our bare bones. Did you know you could rent gear? Until I started looking into this, I didn't know you could rent gear. And most places that rent this type of equipment do it in a way to keep that to be the lowest part of your budget. And in some cases, you can rent it and have it shipped to your house from like Hollywood or wherever. They'll put it in a box and ship it to you. Now that is going to cost you an upfront deposit that's usually pretty high or you'll have to use your personal credit card for it. But if you have a rental place in town, it's usually a little easier and either way they'll bring it to you. You don't necessarily have to go pick it up. So that takes care of a lot of your rental truck out of your production cost. So as you see, I got the rental truck down to 250 because you're only going to need that really on the days you're moving equipment from place to place. Um, instead of using a studio, I got us down to a hotel room and a backdrop with a green screen so you can put whatever wall you want behind you. If you watch a lot of reality TV and you see that they're sitting in this decent chair and they have this beautiful like vineyard wall behind them, chances are they're sitting in front of a green screen. Now with a green screen, you're going to need to rent a little bit more lighting equipment because you have to light the green screen separately and it does require a little bit more skill but it does save you a ton of money look at this for our camera and lenses and tripod and filters all of this as you see by our miscellaneous being 10 percent of our overall budget all of our camera gear is cheaper than the sony a7s3 now if you want to buy your own camera you can probably buy one for about 600 you can probably get a decent lens kit for about another 600 so you're still going to save money but this might be a way to do it that saves you a little more because if you don't don't go that full time you're not spending as much now if you want to get like a decent 600 dollars starter camera go for it i suggest a canon uh eos i use the m200 i don't know if i would use this for a documentary i probably will but the m50 is also a really good starter camera and it's about $600. Sony, the Alpha 6, I believe, is a really good starter camera for about six. So there's a lot of them out there. Um, this is that same Manfredo head. Might as well spend money where you can. Um, we're cutting back on other things so that we have that in there. And the filters, you can actually rent the filters at the same time as purchasing 
or with the, the camera and the lights and the microphones. All of this stuff is rentable. And again, we keep the two lavalier mics because you might use those at different times. And if you have to go back and do voiceover or re-recording of any kind of audio and you've already shipped back your uh, rental equipment, you have the lavalier mics so that they can talk into those. And you will need your own batteries and SD cards, but all of this is included for half the price. Um, permits and licenses rather than shooting on the street. So we're doing a, a thing on Amazon. The only thing I can figure for Amazon would be we're filming a truck driving down the street. This way you don't have to worry about that. You can just purchase some B-roll footage from uh, Adobe stock and you're good to go. Um, you're not renting the truck all five days. So this is on the assumption, hey, we're gonna be shooting in this hotel room for five days. We're gonna rent the truck the day for the, the five days that we're in the, that we're actually shooting. We're not gonna rent it for the whole five days. We're gonna rent it for one day, drive out, set everything up, film the interview, break it down, drive it back, return the truck, a couple of weeks later, go do the same thing. You see what I'm saying? It requires more work, but you're saving some money. And the craft services, it, keep it the same, about $150, $200, but it really just depends on how many days of filming that you need your whole crew there. Um, now, speaking of crew, you work out deals with them. So you're gonna be your own director, right? Uh, you'll be your own ED as well. You'll just set everybody, every, all the shots up. You'll tell everybody where to sit. You'll direct from beside the camera. Now, if you are doing an interview style and you're directing, <clears throat> my suggestion, set yourself here, put the camera right over your shoulder, aim directly at your subject so that when they are responding directly to you, they're looking directly towards the camera. They might not be looking directly at the camera, but the, it would be the difference of this and this. See what I'm saying? You're not really messing anything up there. And um, you still want a sound engineer and you still want a, a DP, but work out a deal with a DP to give them more on the back end and less on the front end and maybe ask them to bring their own focus puller or their own assistant and everybody rigs for themselves. And then your talent, if you are still wanting to do the expository, your best bet is find someone who is not necessarily represented by an agent yet. The reason being is the agent is going to try to convince them to go above scale and all you can afford on this budget is scale and you want to pay union scale. And then post-production, we keep everything pretty, like this is pretty much, the only thing I took off was the second monitor and you find a film student willing to do the coloring on their own computer. Other than that, everything else stays pretty much exactly the same. All right, let's recap. We have our subject. We know the style of documentary we want to do. We know our audience. We know how we plan to distribute it and how we plan to fund it. And we figured out how to create a budget and we put that budget together. We know how much money this is going to cost us. So that is it. That is the planning stage done. You can package all of that information up and go and sell your documentary to an investor. And once you do that and you get the money, then we move into pre-production. Pre-production is probably the shortest span of time you're going to spend aside from production, depending on how it's set up. But pre-production, it started once you started putting together your budget and is moving forward now into setting up how you're going to shoot your documentary. Here's what I mean by that. A lot of people tend to fall into that trap of thinking, I'm making a documentary. I don't need to worry about setting up shots or being, being having too much written down or thought out because I'm just gonna let the story tell itself. And you're not wrong, but you're also not right. You are going to want to be fluid and let the story tell itself, but you need to have a base plan. So what you want to do now, you've spent your time on your budget, you know how many days worth of shooting you can afford to do. So you want to plan every day as much as you can. Yes, things are going to happen and you're going to go over schedule or you're going to be under schedule or you're not going to be able to shoot on certain days. Like there are going to be things that you can't control. So now we're at the pre-production phase where we start controlling what we can. The easiest way to do that is to create your, your set list or your shot list. So you know, 
So let's say we're doing our expository. We have Jeff Bezos giving us money. He also gave us 100% access to our local warehouse. So we know we can be in the warehouse from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And after that, we have to leave. And we know we can be in this room at this time, this room at this time, this room at this time. So we go in before we start filming. We let we have him let us go in. We walk around those rooms. We figure out what our shots are going to be. Take the camera with you. Take some pictures. Get your angles down. And then you want to take out pieces of paper and write out storyboards. And a storyboard in its basic form, do you remember the old comics you read in the newspaper as a kid? It's just that. It's... You, you draw a square, you draw people in it. It can be stick figures, it can be anything. You just have your camera angle set up and you know a basic shot you wanna get and you have every day planned out before the first day of shooting. And the reason you wanna do that is because you want going in there, you wanna have as few surprises as possible. Remember, we only set our miscellaneous budget to be at 10%. So. If you got to keep your entire crew five extra days, that's going to be more than 10%. And if you have a contract with your crew, you're going to have to pay them. Not only that, like I said, Jeff Bezos only gave us permission to be in, the, in there on these certain days in this certain time frame. So if we don't get the shot, we don't get the shot and you have to work around it. So make it as easy on yourself as possible and plan everything out and then once you get there set your camera up and just film literally just film it and keep keep filming fill up every card you can sd cards like i said they're about 50 bucks each that's the probably the lowest cost item on your budget so buy them fill them up get it get as much information as you can hundreds of hours of footage will make you a three hour documentary or a two hour documentary I think that's pretty much everything you need up to this point to know up to this point. If I missed anything, please tell me in the comments. Again, we are running the subscription promotion, so please share this video as much as you can. Like, subscribe, notification bell, comment, do anything you can do to kind of get the algorithm to put this out to as many people as possible. And so we can get to that point. Until the next video, guys, I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much for being here. Stay safe, stay healthy. God bless, and just keep filming, keep editing. God bless, guys. Have a great week.